Well, good morning, track two. That made you jump, didn't it? <laughs> How are we all doing? Yeah, good to see a few of those nice red cups kicking around. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Anthony. I'm the Global Learning Design Manager for Costa Coffee, um, which is available outside in the foyer at any time. Um, <laughs> And this time last year, I would have been sat over there where my guests are, um, patiently waiting for my turn to tell my story. Um, and speaking to people at last year's conference, the big thing that came out was, do you know what, apart from all the networking and having the fun in the evening, the next best thing about learning technology is hearing real people talk about real things that make a real difference. Um, so when I was asked to, if I was interested in chairing sessions, that was kind of the criteria, I will but it has to be that kind of session. So that's what we've got lined up for you. Um, as Don alluded to uh, in his logistics session, which was lengthy and comprehensive, I think you will find, um, it's really important that we can link back what we talk about in these sessions to reality. So this will not be 70 minutes of you sat there listening to people talk at you. There will be an element of that. Um, but what we hope to get to relatively quickly is, is a real discussion about, so what does that mean to us? There's loads of seats over this side, guys, if you want to come in. There's some lovely people for you to meet. Um, so if it's okay with you, what we're going to do is, is have our three presenters tell their story. We'll go back to back to back on that, um, and then we'll open out questions for those of you who are brave enough to want to grab a mic and do that. Um, but then we're going to lead a discussion really about so what has this meant for us what are we going to do what support do we need what challenges might we face in terms of really bringing learning leadership to our organizations okay now the one thing i have learned from these events is the best thing i can do is get out of the way and give as much space to these guys as possible so without further ado if you wouldn't mind welcoming to the stage the man the myth the legend mr nigel payne Thank you very much for that. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm going to try and lift up the atmosphere a bit. I think we should all be happy and joyous that we're all together in this session. And it's going to be focusing on you, basically. It's on learning leaders. And what I want to do to kick off is just explain a little bit of the context and then set up two really brilliant case studies. So you know, I've got Anthony for my coffee, Hilti for my tools, and Anne Summers for my toys. It's a perfect integrated <laughs> philosophical position to take. And I want to share with you a little bit of the context. Um, I just published a book which is available freely on the Kogan page stand and down and so uh, But I wrote like I write all my books in a rage. And the rage underlying this book was that I felt that learning had to step up and Part of the problem with learning in organizations that was definitely annoying other people in the organization was learning focusing on learning. I think there's a bigger picture and, and a wider vision, and I want to just sketch that, and then you'll get some really concrete examples. So I think that there are massive opportunities ahead for learning, not just to make a difference, but to be integrated into the strategy of organizations. And I cannot understand how organizations can be nimble, agile, curious, innovative, without massively driving that through learning. Learning is the fundamental for survival in this age of turbulence and transformation and challenge. So I'm very, very optimistic, but there are big storm clouds around. And I'm really sure that if you don't step up, if you continue to focus on an even bigger menu of courses or focus on 75% of people really like what we do, you will annoy people to the point where they'll say, we can actually manage without you. And the truth is that 70 or 80% of the learning that goes on inside organizations which you work for happens without you doing anything at all. It happens because people talk to each other, they find stuff, they live and learn in an age of continuous connectivity amongst themselves and the outside world. And I, I was talking last night to someone and saying that you know, I still find it astonishing that in 2007, the iPhone came out and changed the world. 
And yesterday I, I set out and I got about half a mile from home and I realised I'd left my phone at home and I just stood paralysed for about 30 seconds thinking, I, I haven't got time to go back. And then I turned and walked back and went and got my iPhone and I was late. And that is simply because it's glued to my pipe. I just feel like I'm not a whole human being without it, pathetic as that may sound. But the idea that that device, which is part of me, I have to kind of check in at the door. I can't use it for doing all the things I need to use in the workplace. It's crazy. We, we have to work with, not work against, or work separately. And you can say, security, there is issue. That. You can solve all the issues because it's never going away. You're never going to persuade anybody that something that is tethered to a desktop or doesn't work on a screen bigger than you know, 12 by, by 10 is going to last or endure or make a big impact. So there's this massive opportunity, but I think that you have to grasp it and not do same old, same old. So let's work through the title of this session. So the first bit is influence. I have had countless learning leaders whinge at me saying, we haven't got a seat at the top table, we haven't got a seat at the top table. You don't demand a seat at the top table, you get invited in because your contribution is so critical to delivering the strategy. And you still have people who say to me, can you help me with my learning strategy? The answer is, you shouldn't have a learning strategy. You should have the learning component of the strategy of your organisation. How do you help the people deliver the strategy that has been set? Not, let's build something completely separately. And I hang my head in shame. When I was running the BBC Learning, we had 500 staff, we had a huge budget. We thought we were almost, we could do what the hell we liked. So we kind of, we did align with the organisation, but we set our own strategy as a learning executive all on our own, and we then showed it to HR, who said, yeah, that's all right. Then we passed it up through the executive board. No one ever came and sat with us and said, this is what we're trying to do with the organisation. We kind of guessed a little bit, but we were pathetically inadequately prepared for making that massive contribution to the organisation. And it was dragging people screaming into a completely different room in order to be able to do that. So you've got to have influence, but you've got to have the right influence. Just st stamping your feet and saying, I want influence, is not going to give you influence. You earn it. And the second thing is that that's a wonderful cartoon from The Economist last week, I think. But basically, too much of learning is trying to force one plug into another plug that doesn't fit. You know, all of our stuff, all the things we know, all of our debates about curriculum and all... And, and, Appreciation of learning is irrelevant. This is, you've got to get it, you've got to find a socket that works with the business socket. Your socket is never going to be the one that everyone will adapt to. There is a, there is a world socket, there is a business socket, it's not going to be learning. Learning has to work out what it needs. Learning has to decide how it can adapt and fit and make a big difference, make that connection. You ain't going to do it by pushing harder and harder with your own socket. You've got to work out what is required to really plug the organisation together. And if, if you don't do what you need to do, you will not, not just fail the organisations, but potentially the organisation will fail. And people who say, they don't listen to me, I'm still given a menu of items, I'm still sent an email by my boss or the boss's boss saying, we need three negotiation skills, two interpersonal skills, and we had a bit of bullying, so an anti-bullying course, please, for these four people. And what can I do? The answer is, you push back, you push back, you push back. You have a conversation about need, you have a conversation about appropriate solution. You resist. You have to kind of educate the people if they don't understand, and if you try your best and they still don't listen, you find another job in a place that will, because you'll always be frustrated and the organisation won't do well. And the last one is engagement. I think that there's a massive stairway going up and there's an incredible plateau, but the danger is that you kind of retreat back into what you know and what you're certain of and what's comfortable. And I don't think you should be doing that. I think that that's the wrong way to go, the wrong approach. You've got to remember you're on a stairway and each step is a step towards 
the goal of being completely integrated into the business, completely integrated into the business strategy, and only doing stuff that makes a difference. And there are huge companies like Procter & Gamble who have cut away all of the learning that was nice and comfortable and people liked in order to focus on delivering the strategy for the chief executive because he needed all of the resources of the learning team to work on and build and drive the new strategy through an organization that was stretched in the market and stretched in the world. And if they can do it with this massive legacy, with this huge catalog of programs on anything they wanted, anything you wanted to learn, and said, it's all going, we focus on the strategy of the organization, we'll help you find the other stuff, but you can do it. You, can, you do it out of the workplace, do it in the workplace. Work it out for yourself. Share it, find other resources. You can do that. We give you permission, but we're not going to do it for you. We've only got one job, which is to make this place better and help it thrive or just help it survive. So these are the kind of roles that I think you should be focusing on. I think there's a massive role in defending or if the culture is not supportive, attacking and rebuilding the culture and creating an environment of collaboration. Now, in my book, what became absolutely clear is where people are afraid and where they don't trust, they won't collaborate. They won't share learning. They won't ever be learning percolating through the organization. It's quite simple. So you sometimes have to focus on those things, getting the culture right, and the learning will kind of sort itself out. Don't focus on the learning. And increasingly, it's not about programs. They can have an important role, but it's about building a great learning environment, curating fabulous experiences for people, and generally helping people solve their own problems, facilitating, not driving, and leading. And then being the people to tell learning story. Uh, that is one of... Um, Brinkerhoff's books, Telling Learning Story, which is a book about impact measurement. And I think you can define the impact far more usefully through telling good stories, from articulating the change and the difference that you've made, far more than getting anal about going on an ROI course and proving that this program delivered 1,122% ROI. I don't think anyone gives a damn, nor do they give a damn that 75% enjoyed or really enjoyed what you do. No one cares. What they care about is the story about the contribution that it makes. And learning changes lives, and I believe learning can actually change organizations. And then finally, governance. You know, get out there. Look, but one of the only, not only, but one of the brilliant ideas that I had in the BBC was I created a learning board and I put the chief executive as the chairman of it. I only met twice a year and all the budget or the vast majority of my budget was allocated by that board, not by me. And people thought I was totally insane that this was giving away all the, what little power I had. I'd just given it all away. But what it meant was that everything was owned by the business. Everything was directed by the business and they, because they were involved, because they were allocating resources, suddenly a whole bunch of people who'd taken no interest before were totally committed and fascinated by what, what was happening, what learning was doing. Because in some ways they were putting their name to it. And when you get people to put their name to something, they take interest and they take note. So think about governance. Governance is way more important than most people give it credit for. It's kind of a yawn session. But I think you get the governance right, lots of other things fall into place. <coughs> And then just finally, in the remaining minute, um, this is Josh's model of a learning culture. But I want you to focus on those four boxes, and I want you to just to look at these two. We spend so much time on acquisition of knowledge and skill, so much time of application of knowledge and skill. I'm not saying they're insignificant. But if you don't have, above that, the ability to learn and the motivation to learn, Nick Sheldon Jones calls it, you need to care. If you care, you learn. You know that from all of your own experience. When you want to learn something, you learn it. And you don't go, I wonder what learning style it is in. Who gives a damn? What matters is you care. So you've got to create pathways to make people believe in their learning ability, and then you've got to motivate them. And if you can do those two things, the others make become easier for you. Focus down in the weeds, 
more and more programs, more and more learning objectives, you end up missing the whole point. People can do it themselves, but they need the environment and the confidence and the skills. So this is a great time to be in learning, and it's a great time to work closely with an organisation and feel engaged and feel part of the big picture, or completely and utterly out of it. That's all I've got to say. So two great case studies now. Anthony. Thank you. Thank Andrew. you. So just before we move on to Rachel, I just have one question for you, Nigel, if I may. Because um, what you're saying to me sounds very, very familiar. I, I see lots of organisations that have this journey to make. If you were working in an organisation where you still have that separation between a learning curriculum and a business agenda, what would be the first thing you would say to do? Uh, what I, the, the first thing I would say to you is, let's just do a little bit of mapping. Let's look at the business agenda and just quickly, dirtily, let's try and map one over the other. And how far or wide is the alignment? Where are the areas of close overlap? Where are the areas of um, massive overlap? And where are the areas where your wonderful learning agenda doesn't even begin to meet the business agenda? That, to me, gives you time for action. That gives you a list of things that you've got to do. And unfortunately, the truth is, if you're going to do new stuff, you have to stop doing old stuff. And that's very hard. It's a hard message. But I would almost say, throw out your learning agenda. Look at the business agenda. If you're starting from scratch, just you, where would you start? What would you build? And you'll usually find that doesn't map very closely at all to the learning agenda, which has come up over years and years. Focus on the future. Focus on what's most useful. And don't be scared to say, we've got to retire that. Fantastic. Thank okay. you. Do you mean we might have to ditch the time management course and actually focus on why people don't have time? That is exactly right. <laughs> oh, no. That is exactly right, Anthony. Right. Thank you very much, Nigel. Uh, so, as, according to the training journal, all the way from Colorado <laughs> to next-gen learning systems. Thank you. Quite sure that how that works. <laughs> Please welcome <laughs> Rachel. Thank you. And that was such a great introduction because it's exactly where we started. We do have a learning strategy, um, but it is an expansion of where we built out our corporate strategy, of which one of our fundamental building blocks was developing high-performing global teams. So we are a large organization. We're not huge, but we're about 27,000 people. We sit in 120 countries, um, and we deliver our content in 34 languages. You can imagine that that means it's a relatively complex situation for us. And four years ago, we were in the place of developing programs, translating programs, delivering programs. And we said, wait a minute, we really need to stop because we don't have the capacity to do that. Our team is 17 people. Um, that's total. <laughs> and there is no way that we can cover 27,000 people across the globe. So, so we started from a business perspective that said we just don't have the people. Um, we're not able to develop people effectively. And then we started looking at what we were doing. And we found out that we were teaching Stripe how to whistle, but we weren't affecting the performance of the organization. And when we realized that, we did a fundamental shift in how we approached our jobs, um, the, the way we looked at people development, the tools that we use for people development. And we moved from an everything you're ever going to need. So, so we, our headquarters is in the mountains of the Swiss Alps. Um, so backpacks are, you know, and hiking is, is one of the things we look at and said we really need to focus on how do we transfer that learning into action and how do we become much more agile with that. So we wanted to look at it and say, how do we make this fit into the real world? How do we ensure that our experiences, our learner experiences, link directly back to performance? And that doesn't mean that we are matching every course that you do with how much sales you get. That is absolutely not the point. What it does mean 
is that instead of us creating programs, instead of us <laughs> generating courses that you can go through, we actually took a complete shift and we said, hang on, our foundation is that we are a caring and performance oriented organization. So who knows how to do the jobs? In your companies, who knows how to do the jobs? Anybody? The people, oh my goodness. The ones who are actually doing the job, not the learning and development department. By the time we pulled somebody, even in a two year rotational position, two years out of the workforce, the, the actual person doing the job, means that you're no longer in touch with the customers. You're maybe not so used to the software we use or, or those types of things. So instead of us saying that we need to create all of this training material, we instead um, selected what's called a next-gen learning system because we knew we already had the culture in place. We have a culture who is willing to share. We have a culture who was very performance-oriented. We had a culture who cared about each other. So we ended up just putting in a platform that allowed people to share their knowledge, to talk with each other, to bring things to light that maybe we couldn't get to. And, and of course, as I mentioned, 120 countries, 34 languages, um, 27,000 people, that's not necessarily an easy task. I can, however, say, it, it, we're two years on this journey now since we started, and we now have 300 and roughly 360 um, learning communities out there on the platform. 165 of those are managed by L&D teams. So 50% of those are managed by L&D teams. That doesn't mean L&D is creating the content for those. That means L&D is acting as the community manager. Is the L&D is in there and they're ensuring that curated content is, rises to the top or that topics get built. Um, we have 167 that are completely managed by the business, by the function. Um, of this, we also stopped and we looked and we said, because at first we were populating content. So we were taking existing courses, sometimes we were breaking them up in bite size or working with vendors to, to create things to put it out there. And we knew it was gonna take a little while. So we looked at 2018. In 2018, we have 47,000 individual pieces of content on the system. 38,000 of those are created by people who are not in learning and development. 3,600 are created by my team. So there are some other L&D people out there who are creating some of the, the content, a few thousand pieces, but by far and large, they have created learning experiences that match the real world because they're sharing their own product demonstration. They're sharing what they have done out there and other people are taking that on, learning from that, keeping it very much just in the essentials. And I think there is, you know, some of the people on our team were a little nervous at first because basically we said we're gonna work ourselves out of a job we are literally going to, to work ourselves out of a job because we're going to make it possible for everybody to share their knowledge, share their learning, and put their information from the real world right into a learning environment. That's kind of scary, but it's so empowering two years later to see the organization embrace it. 97% of our population is actually accessing and learning. And they're not learning sitting at a desk. They're learning, of course, most of our people are um, Salesforce, so they're learning on their phones. They're taking this and they're going out and they're doing exactly that bare essential piece that I need in the moment I need it. And then they're performing. all from my side.
Thank you very much, Rachel. So the, the burning question for me then is, with all of that content being created by all of your people all around the world, how do you maintain quality? What's, what's the governance look like for that? <laughs> you know, that, that's one of the things that people ask us. They're always like, well, what if somebody puts something bad out there? Uh, what if they put something inaccurate? So that has actually happened. Um, we had someone who came from the United States organization post a bit of information out um, in the UK, which did not meet insurance regulations. You guys have crazy fire laws here. Um, and if I have to walk through one more fire door, I may scream. Um, but it was up for 17 seconds before another user went in and said, that doesn't apply in the UK, it doesn't meet our insurance regulations. And that is exactly what happens when you put the empowerment in the people to create the content. It's a great question though, great thank answer. you. And I guess that's where trust and governance combine, right? So Nigel was talking about those, both of those two things. Trust your people, that's where the knowledge lives. Trust them to share. And hey, we're all people. We're, and we, I think we can also learn from when we put things up that maybe aren't perfect too. Fantastic. Okay. So this is a presentation that caused some real interest when I was reviewing it in the open plan office <laughs> last week, just as our global MD walked in behind me. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this. So please welcome Gail. I was actually wondering what he was going to say to introduce me, because we get various different responses. Clearly, this is my stunt double. I wasn't available on the day they did this shoot. So um, I bet most of you have probably heard of Anne Summers, um, and it's probably crossed your mind that we do all sorts of naughty stuff with our learning and development. Well, actually, we do. Um, but we do lots of really great normal L&D stuff, too. And I think probably as a small family business, we've got a massive presence on the UK high street. Um, but we firmly believe in growing our own talent and developing our teams to be the, really the best they can be. And um, we're all about female empowerment in both the boardroom and, of course, in the bedroom. Our board of directors is 70% women. Um, we um, have um, 4,000 self-employed women in our party plan channel who hold thousands of parties up and down the country each week. Some of you have probably been to one. We've 800 retail colleagues and we've 300 colleagues at our support centre and warehouse made up of both women and men, of course. So today I'm going to take you through the journey that we went on or I went on to take Anne Summers from paper-based training right through to e-learning. So our brand then is sexual empowerment for every woman. Our brand is iconic, it's unique, it's exciting, it's sexy, it's fun, and we know our colleagues really love working for us. But working for such a unique brand does present quite a few challenges, um, and no more so than when you're considering some kind of learning and development solution. It has to support the brand, and it has to support our overall people objective of retaining, developing, keeping the best talent. I was really keen to move from paper-based training um, for so many reasons, mainly for retail, um, but actually I wanted to put L&D on the map at Ann Summers and I wanted to prove to the business that actually, you know, L&D can really support you with achieving results. But above all else, it was really, really important to me that we had a blended learning approach. So colleagues have to demonstrate that they can interact with our customers properly and not just complete the online quiz. So all of my research into e-learning at the time seemed to start and end with really, really expensive solutions. We're a small family business. They were all really, really corporate, way too corporate for Ann Summers. Um, and I explored loads and loads of different options, but I think um, whilst I didn't rule out the most expensive one, I knew deep down that there was no way we were going to be able to afford it. Um, and I also knew that for an e-learning platform to have credibility, we had to be able to author that, and it had to look like us, and it had to have our tone of voice. That was really important. So in the end, it came down to two options, and we decided to work with Nimbly Learning. So with those tight budgets that I'm sure a lot of you can um, resonate with, I had to take on a bit of a marketing and PR role to secure the investment for this. So I talked about e-learning at every opportunity with everybody that I could, basically anyone that was interested who would listen, or maybe they weren't interested, but they had to listen. Um, I did demonstrations and then I focused on really selling the benefits and what it could really do for our business. Um, I also wanted our store managers and our regional business managers to take a bit more accountability for training and the learning and development of our colleagues in stores, right through from induction to moving on up the career path. 
Um, and Nimble's a really great way to make this happen as part of a wider solution. So we call our platform the Learning One. Um, and those of you that are regular and summer shoppers, no need to admit it, you're fine, um, will know that um, it's named after our iconic Rampant Rabbit collection. Um, the initial plan for me was to update the Retail Training Academy, like I mentioned, which supports the development of our colleagues right through um, replacing those paper workbooks that I mentioned earlier. So from around May 2016, we started to create all of our courses in Nimble, and I worked with all the experts across the business um, to think about what was their existing content, how did we want to translate that over to e-learning, and then my team took all of that on board and did that. I say my team, there was one other person. All our experts were asked to review their topics. That gave me feedback as well on what they thought about the platform and got them used to using it. I kept really, really close to my stakeholders. That sounds really obvious, but in a small business, it's really important. I worked with our people champion in retail, and she supported me properly. And then I turned my PR attention to the end user. So again, I did demos, did everything I could to talk about the learning one, had a stand at our annual retail conference where our store managers could actually see the platform in action, they could see what it looked like, how it would work, um, they had the opportunity to have a bit of a play with it, and more importantly, to ask questions. So following that, I created a bit of a pilot group of people from across the estate because I wanted them to feel, embold, um, feel involved. And because we're all about empowerment, I wanted them to have a voice and be really honest with me. They were honest. Um, their feedback was, was really valuable. Let's be honest, this is never plain sailing. So I think I faced into every challenge along the way. Um, all of them were Anne Summers' faults with proxy servers, technology, everything. We faced into it, but we overcame them all. None of those um, were nimbles. I had team shortages, team, two of us again, um, team shortages, and then we were halfway through creating everything and marketing went, oh, we don't really like those logos now. Can you go back and change them all? Um, so I think, you know, you name it, we faced into it. So when it came to our launch, um, Nimble advised me, take, take small steps, but no, we don't do things like that out in summers. We, it's all or nothing. So in the end, I went for a bit of a phase launch, but for induction and core, it was really important to me that every new starter from a certain date had the full experience. So all of our new starters get their um, Learning One logon details with their starter pack, and our new managers get two weeks training, um, the basics of running an Anne Summer store. And in keeping with that blended learning approach, they get a learning journal, which encourages them to put into practice what they've learned, take action, and reflect on it. And during that time, they're supported by an academy development manager. They're the best of the best of our retail store managers. So, very important date for me. 7th of September 2016, we launched the Learning One with 21 courses, enrolling 800 learners all at once. So, for me, this was the first time we ever we were able to reach out to all individual learners with a consistent training message. Such a step forward for Anne Summers. We had some really great feedback following launch. Positive, mostly, but some not so positive comments through. In fact, there were over a thousand pages of feedback, and I went through every single one of them, and it was really invaluable, and it really helped us to shape how we use the platform going forward. So what was our engagement like? So um, in the period from launch until the end of January 2017, the completion rate for our induction was actually 90%. It's now moved up to 95%, um, which is great, and it means that we're getting our consistent training message out there. They really engage with it. Moving on into November 2016, we launched our internal progression program, so supporting those colleagues who wanted to move up our career path. So again, we developed more topics, we had new objectives in our learning journal, and then we created some soft skills um, content as well to run some workshops. So then 2017 arrived, and I was really keen to work on embedding the platform, keeping it front and center of everyone's mind. But um, I didn't want to stand still because I knew the platform could offer us so much more, and we got such great engagement. So in 2017, I launched the Learning One at Head Office, a completely different beast. Um, so I went a bit slower here and started off with induction, combined that with a new onboarding offer. But now we're a whole year on from the launch in retail. So the next step was to introduce the catalog option. And the catalog option is really great because it allows people to self-enroll on topics that they want to develop in. So again, we wrote 20 more topics or 20 more courses, and it was another step on. 
So in 2017, we launched the whole um, Learning One's head office, and our increase in enrolments and completions of this from November until the end of December 2017 was up 200%. I was, I was amazed by that. So 2018, for us, um, we've continued to see the success of the platform. The catalogue's been regularly added to, a commitment we've kept to to keep learners logging back in and keep them interested. But the biggest success I wanted to share with you today is around our product training. Don't worry, I'm not going to get a case out or anything like that. Um, but our customers really expect our colleagues to be true experts. And our colleagues want to feel empowered and knowledgeable to deliver really great service, particularly around product. So they want relevant training, they want rationale, they want context, basically they want stuff they can't get off the box. Um, we've always relied on our store managers sharing product knowledge training, you know, printing it out, sticking it on the back of the toilet door, however they share it. But I knew that I could reach out to every colleague with the learning one and that they could have the information for themselves. So our results following um, the launch of a new product where we pop this on the catalogue was that 695 colleagues enrolled with us. That was 86% of our total population. So this wasn't something that was compulsory. This was, you know, if you want more information, go here and get it. 52% of those were sales colleagues. So we'd reached a wider audience already. And interestingly for me, 80% um, of the sales of that product were driven by retail. And um, also the um, product was 20% upon sales plan. Uh, versus some previous product launches. So I put myself forward for um, a finalist for the Positive Business Impact Award in the, in the Nimble Awards. But we didn't win, but we were highly commended. Another first, Fran Summers. But I think the thing for me here is that, can I take that and say that that, that learning one topic contributed to the performance of the product? Yes, I think I'll take that one. Thank you very much. So just to finish then, if I was to give you five top tips that I wish somebody had shared with me right at the very beginning of my journey, um, they'd be, do you know what, do all your technical checks first. Now that sounds really, really stupid, but we faced everything. Um, and even to the point where, you know, it's working on one computer but not on another, so what's the difference and why? And they were all our fault. Um, if it's going into retail for the retailers in you, where are your teams going to listen to it? How are they going to listen to it? What does that look like? Keep planning. I think I plan daily, hourly, weekly, monthly. Sounds really obvious. Stakeholders, really, really important again. Involve them at every stage. Get them to use it. Get them to really feel it. And I think for me, it was about not losing sight of other ways of learning. You know, remember the, the blended learning approach, but also that we learn a lot from just talking to others as well. And then finally, I think the biggest piece for me was that if you're in a really small team of two, I might have mentioned that, um, playing all roles is all consuming. And I don't think I'd realized until the end that the business realized, wondered where I'd been for five months, because I'd, I'd been all consumed by this whole role. Um, so don't forget about your, your profile as well in the business. So just to finish, I think then that um, I'd say I'm really proud of all, the, all the, you know, the challenges we faced and what we did. We had our launch date. We went full on. But I think most importantly, putting the platform in and being able to truly author our own content and make it look like us really put us in the driving seat. It made us really credible. And I think that now we're able to react to business needs, we can really take a lead um, in you know, making sure our colleagues are ready for whatever the next step the business is that they want to take. So thank you for listening. Um, thank you, that's it from me. <laughs> thank you, Gail. I think that's a really good example of if you provide genuinely useful stuff that helps people do what they're trying to do, they do it. And I think, you know, in some cases they can find that themselves. In some cases we have to help them find that. We have to provide the stuff that really does help them. So fantastic to see not only how engaged your, your team are, but also what a difference it's really making. So, wonderful. Thank you, Gail. Um, so, we're going to move on to kind of open questions. If there's anything that's piqued your interest that uh, you want to ask Nigel, Rachel, or Gail, we're going to do that for a few moments. Um, my experience is that may dry up quickly, and then we'll have some proper conversations. Um, and, and I guess, really, the, the topic of that is, so what? for you right now, where you are and where you need to get to, what is it that you need to do? Um, and all four of us will be kind of hovering around and, and we'll be happy to answer questions. So who's got a, a question they'd like to ask publicly, first of all? <laughs> Over here. I'll, I'll go with mine, Mandy, I'm closer. 
I think it affects all three of you, really. But what would you say, thinking about, we're talking about um, leadership or learning leadership, what were the key leadership skills or go-tos that you went to at the point of, ah, <laughs> which ultimately is what, you know, we dig down and go to. So. Go for it. I think the, the thing to tie back into what Nigel said is, is you don't ask for a seat at the table. Um, you provide value and you get invited into that. So the skill there is really multifold. It's networking. You need to know your business. You need to know the stakeholders in your business, the influencers, the people who make a difference and use that. Don't be scared. Don't be shy. Don't sit back and be quiet. Um, you don't have to go as crazy as I do. Everyone recognizes the crazy hair I have. So you don't have to do that, but you do have to have passion and, and realize that you have something important to say. You can make a difference. And even if you're like me asking a Swiss company to go to social learning um, or you're in a completely different situation, it's still the same, I think. Would you guys agree? I'm taking on the crazy hair thing. It's going to be my new identity <laughs> very, very soon. Uh, that, that get, you've got to get people out of their comfort inside the, the learning bubble and push them out, and you've got to do the same and have conversations about the organisation. You know, for, for me, I learnt so much by spending a day with a journalist, spending a day with a programme maker, spending a day with someone, uh, an engineer, uh, trying to understand their world, and therefore I could talk intelligently about what they did, rather than trying to second-guess everything and, and putting a kind of firewall between, between us as a learning team and our lovely curriculum talk and the real world. And the result was they kind of couldn't have cared less at the beginning. They didn't think we had anything to offer because they didn't, they didn't think we knew what it was like for them. So you, you absolutely need to understand that real world and have lots and lots of conversations. I totally agree, and I, and I certainly relate to that learning bubble thing. I think if you haven't got a seat at the table, it's, you probably don't have anything to add yet. Uh, I'm going to give you... Who was next? Thanks. It's for Nigel. Uh, when you talk about governance, I see that we have, the, in, in my company, we're working with the clear governance, with the business people taking the decisions, what we need to learn together. We do develop the solutions together with subject matter experts from the business and also deliver their products together with people if it's face to face. And of course, we're going much more digital, so we are totally going to the different uh, devices. Uh, yet what I struggle with, even talking with the CEO and so on all the time, that it doesn't go, we have many cohorts, more than 200,000, to get it really down to every person to, 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 to get there. So now I'm more going towards, uh, you know, get to the coworker themselves so they can pull. That's kind of the strategy, but I don't feel that the people who say, yes, we want to have this, when it comes to the, the proof is in the pudding, so to say, they don't really uh, do that. What, what is your advice to me? How do I get to not only getting the yes from the uh, business leaders when we do the governance and decision making and put the budget, yeah. but actually get to also use it and, and promoting it? Yeah, it, it's the kind of bacon and eggs that the, the chicken is involved, but the, the pig is committed. I, th I think you've got to move from just talking about stuff to getting them involved. And one of the best conversations I had uh, with, with those business leaders is you look them in the eyes and you say, what would you need to see happening if this in this organization to know that what we're doing is working? And then they begin to focus on, well, if this happened and that happened, mm -hmm. and if we could see these things, even just at the beginning that that was happening, and that becomes your kind of monitoring and, and in some ways your evaluation strategy. And when you start to have discussions about the way the business is changing and where the business isn't changing, you then have people who don't just say, yeah, learning's great, yeah, we, oh, we all need to learn. They suddenly start seeing it as... This will actually help my career. It will help this whole organization be successful. So you sort of switch the conversation away from learning to their world. 
and bridge across the two. Uh, still the conversation with the same people, or would you suggest to actually go even further into their... Yeah, well, if you, if you, if you have agreement from them about the, what, what do they need to see change, you then have to work out how does that ramify, what are the ramifications through the organisation. You have a hell of a lot of other conversations. And wh one of the things I really like about Brent Brinkerhoff is that he doesn't say um, you need this complicated algorithms and you need lots of analysis. He says, go talk to people. Who are what are they doing differently? And above all, not what is she doing differently, but what are her staff notice about what she's doing differently? Then you're out there, you're talking about the business and the impact. You're not just talking about, did you like this program? Was it successful? Now, who cares? You talk about the ramifications, and that percolates through. And then you scale it back up from someone at the shop floor right at the sharp end, back up and say, these are the changes that we've identified. Does that satisfy you? Does that, do you feel we're getting somewhere now? So it, it's different conversations. Thank you. OK. Mandy, do you have one over there? Hi, um, a question for Rachel, but I guess it's open to the rest of the panel as well. How did you help your colleagues make the transition to social learning? That's a great question, um, because I think some of it came down to understanding our culture and understanding the risks. So one of the things that we found was that we had a permission-based culture, which meant if the um, leadership was not supportive of it, then people wouldn't go in and share. So we did not have any success when we tried Yammer in 2014. Um, we have not had success with getting people to even join, for example, engineering communities on LinkedIn and, and share that way. Yeah. We needed to, to create almost a pyramid, I guess, of, of how it is. So the learners over here and they're learning and there's, there's things that are available over here for them to learn from each other, but we also needed at the top for the line managers to understand that people's performance and therefore people's development was directly their responsibility and we needed some of our top management, because we are a permission-based culture, we needed our top management to go out and share and say that it's okay. So, so we had people coming out, and sometimes they were talking about things that, that are important to them. So our executive board members were talking about our, learn, or about our corporate strategy. They were talking about what do we mean by leadership? What do we mean by differentiation? What do we mean by a high performing? Because that's what they know. But the funny thing was is most of us don't ever get to talk to those people who are at the very top of the organization. So when we got to see them on a two or three minute video and we realized not only are they sharing their knowledge, but they're inviting us to share theirs. That's a really good answer. A little bit of role modeling, I think. Uh, I'm sure there was one around here. Maybe not. No? Any more for over there? Lovely. Bit of exercise, that'll get my step count up. That's good. Don't I guess I've got a follow-up question. Uh, apologies for you coming all the way over here with a mic, and I've already got one. Um, so I feel bad for you. Uh, so, Rachel, I think what's really interesting about that is that from my experience, when you have things like social learning um, available, and you have you know, lots of groups uh, which are self-curated as well within the organisation, and then when an engagement survey comes out, and there's a, generally a question in there about are you, you know, do you have facilities for learning and development or training and development? Uh, and it normally comes out quite low. Uh, and I always think that that's a shame that there's a huge amount of learning that happens in the organization that's not recognized or perceived to be learning uh, in, in the workforce. And I'm just wondering with, with the amount that you've had uh, in Hilti, is it recognized and is it perceived as learning rather than just being, I've not been on a workshop for six <laughs> months, um, so I'm not getting any training? We don't have a lot of formal learning. Um, so we really, when we adopted Fuse as our next gen learning platform, we also worked with the 702010 Institute to ensure that we were building really on the job performance support and things like that. The, and, and so that's available and I think recognized by the individuals. More critical is the fact that we have those conversations up front for any formal learning, blended learning programs that we're creating. 
And I love Nigel's point because that's the, one of the questions that we ask is we say, paint me a picture of what your team looks like six months from now. What are they doing? What are you seeing? And because most of, of that learning doesn't occur in a workshop. And, and so by, by having the leadership teams acknowledge the fact that everything they saw wasn't a certificate. And, and some of that's cultural because we still have some issues in Eastern Europe where they love having their certificates or, or you know, a little bit here in, in Northern Europe as well. But for the most part, once the leaders know that, that they're actually looking for behaviors on the job that show that this person is performing, and they link that to the fact that they've learned, now people feel like they're developing because they're developing in role and they're getting reinforcement from their team leaders that they're actually doing what needs to be done on the job. Yeah. Could I just add one thing? You know, I actually think that question is the wrong question. I think that's what I would call an L&D-centric question. You're saying, what about your training and development? You want people to say, yeah, it's great. So you, you feel that you've been well-stroked. The question is, I would ask, am I capable of doing my job, or are there gaps in my knowledge or gaps in my, my access to resources? Focus on the job, and then you'll get a much more realistic account of what people actually need and their own sense of how well they can, they can do what they do. And then you've got the beginnings of a conversation. What are, asking questions about learning and development, I, I don't think anyone cares, really. And that's why you get low scores. I, I would agree with you. The, the questions tend to come from an external. Um, so it's, we're not in charge of asking right. very okay. specific questions so that you can set the context. It's, it always tends to be, uh, do, are you, you know, do you have capability for training and development within the organization? And half the time, we look at those questions and go, ugh. We kind of know what the answer is going to be here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, hopefully if there's anyone who works in an external sort of questionnaire company, uh, <laughs> can maybe start to rethink about the, the learning questions would be greatly yeah. appreciated. That would be good. And in the meantime, let's just stop caring about that. It's if the business is performing, there's a reason. And we're part of that equation, I think. I think there's another one in that neck of the woods. So. Hi, yeah, this is a question for Rachel. You talked at the beginning about uh, developing away from a program-based mentality, which I really mm -hmm. agree with, and that fear from your team about what that would mean for their roles. And I'm just interested now, two years later, what do you feel your team's biggest impact is now that this is all up and running mm. on an ongoing basis? The nice thing is, is that the biggest impact is they're having business conversations with people who have the possibility to affect the larger business. So four years ago, we were focused only on our sales team because we're a small team. So the only thing we could do was sales training. Now we get to touch every part of the business because we go in and we're asking these challenging questions. Um, and trust me, sometimes people don't want to hear those challenging questions. So we're not always welcomed in with open arms because they do want us to be a bit order takers and deliver them. I mean, we have one right now where they're saying, well, we need a storytelling course. And, and we're pushing back against the management of our whole organization to say that's a buzzword. You know, talk to us about what it is you're trying to accomplish from your people, and we'll help you understand what skills and competencies that needs. And then together, we can come up with a good solution. So, so people in the team now, and, and we've had some changes. Um, we've had a few people where it didn't fit. They wanted to be. ISD course developers, um, and, and those people have gone and found other places that are more focused on that area. That's okay. We call it graduating. Um, when somebody leaves, it's graduating because you're following your dreams, your, your passion, and you're doing what's, what's right for you. So it should never be looked at as a negative if someone moves on from your team because you've moved in a different direction than their, than their desire is. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it definitely does. I think um, your story, because you're quite far in your kind of maturity path, is quite interesting for people to see, especially if they have that fear, and thinking about what skill sets and mindsets you might require in your L&D team to kind of get you over that hurdle into the next stage and show that you can actually be a strategic voice in the business. So I think that's a really cool angle of your story that, that uh, you drew out there. Thank you. And it's lovely. I mean, honestly, it is so empowering for the people who embrace being a bigger part of the business. We have people who never thought that they would be such an, a critical component of the business. And, 
And that's amazing when, when you get to be a part of that. So, so I highly encourage it. If there's, if there's any way you can challenge your organizations to get your learning and development team to be able to have these pushy conversations. They are a little pushy because it, it hurts sometimes. It's way easier to send somebody to a training workshop than it is to say, I'm painting you a picture of what's happening six months from now and I need your help to get there. Yeah, I would really echo that. I think it's really comfortable to be in that place of what would I like to deliver to people? But it's not as quite as rewarding as what do they need to be able to do what they're trying to do. Uh, we'll take one or two more and then I think we'll uh, move into the discussion. So I think we've got one here. Thanks, Mandy. Thank you. This is a question to Nigel. Um, looking at the slide around learning culture and the motivation to learn, it's something that I think as traditional, I'm using that word traditional, L&D order takers that we've missed out on. And I was just wondering if you could expand on your perspective about what more we can do uh, with that. So there's the performance consulting piece with that question about, you know, what does it look like for you to know that what we're doing is successful? For me, there's the, the change leadership piece at every level of the organisation from the grassroots up, from speaking to our people and our business partners and our leadership. But I was just wondering what your perspective was on what more we can do, because we know that building content Yes, we get a certain amount of people who come, but it's not the be end and end all to, to achieving what we need to achieve for our, our businesses. Yeah, the, there were four critical, compo I, I identified four critical components for le learning culture, and they're all bigger than, than simply learning. The, the first one is about trust. That part of learning, I think, is to create a trust environment where people can share safely. And linked to that is trying to get away from punishment for failure, but the ability to learn from failure and kind of almost celebrate failure. That in WD40, which is one of the big case studies, an incredibly successful company based on driving learning through the organization as fast as you possibly can. And the, the current CEO took over a 200 million market cap company that does stuff in a can and less than 10 years later, it's a $1.2 billion market cap. And that they still only have stuff in a can. It's, the product hasn't changed. But the approach and the curiosity and the engagement and the innovation of staff is what's changed. So they've worked out new pathways, new markets, new ways to endear the product to, the, to its community. And that is very, very important. But they celebrate failure and they've had huge failures on the, on the way and they, each one of those is itemized and if, if you're a manager in WD40, they're not called managers, they're called coaches and your job is to help your staff live the values end of, beginning and end of your job description and what that means is that Inside the values are learning from failure, building trust communities, being willing to share, sharing expertise when, when asked, if at all possible. All of that stuff just creates the learning. It bubbles up from under the culture. The third thing is related to that, that's collaboration. And you have to be able to build collaborative models. We've spent kind of our entire childhood learning on our own and being slapped for talking to the person next to us. And the whole workforce learning is based on sharing and collaboration and not just sitting on your own. And not, being, not feeling that you're successful just because I can do that stuff. Success comes from everyone can do it. So no, no hoarding of learning and knowledge. And the fourth one emerges from all of those three, and that's places to share, essentially. You need space, online, physical. And in Pixar, for example, when Jobs built the new Pixar headquarters that st they're still based in, what Jobs insisted on, there was this big atrium in the, middle of the, in the middle of the campus where you had to come to get coffee, water, small meeting rooms, uh, corners where people could talk. And what it did was it took all the specialist, technical specialist 
individuals in Pixar and teams in Pixar met with each other and huge numbers of problems were solved just because you bumped into someone. And you, you know, the, the, the story people would meet, the CGI people would meet, the animation people. And they would just knew each other and trusted each other and worked on problems. And Pixar was extraordinary. The, 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 the innovation in Pixar, they were inventing a completely new art form, which was the digital, the digital animation that didn't exist before they came in. So Jobs always said that you just like the blue touch paper and stand back. So his blue touch paper was creating that environment and then getting the hell out of it and letting people work on their own problems and, and work, work on each other and solve issues for each other. And Google, Google took a little added item on their HR database. So everyone had to manage their own HR database. But they added... What, am I, what would I consider myself, personal, what would I consider myself to be expert on? List. And then, would I be prepared to coach or at least answer the phone on those areas of expertise? And that was searchable. And it, took, it, it cost nothing, but it transformed the conversations across the organisation. So suddenly it became about sharing and not about me. And Goo was a place full of me, me, me. You know, I'm smart, I'm clever, I do this, I lead on that. So it became, what can I share? How do I share my knowledge? So those, those things seem, from my research, to be indelible components. You can't take them out. And you can't separate them. Yeah, that's a really good point, Nigel. I think traditionally knowledge has been held tight closely, and that's what we've kind of rewarded people for. And I think we need to shift that to actually... Sharing is what we re reward, so I think that's a really, really good point. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left, and I think it's important that we take that time to think about, okay, so what does this mean to us? What are we taking away from this session? And it's really down to you how you want to do that. If you want to discuss that with the people around you, if you want to take a moment just to reflect, if you'd like any of us to, to come and interact and, and have a chat with you, then just, I don't know, wave your hand or something. Um, and we'll do that, and then we'll wrap up, and uh, then it will be either lunchtime, or I would highly recommend going to see Nigel's session and then get lunch afterwards. So, uh, so I'm just hand over to you for, yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> you said it. So uh, we're going to hand over to you guys, and uh, yeah, just flag us if you if you want us to come and join in any of the conversations. All right, thank you very much for a moment.